evil person. So what we've done here is we have fused the behaviour and the person together and made them one thing. And in psychology, this is called cognitive fusion. And cognitive fusion is a false, invalid perspective. Because there are two things here. There's a person and their behaviour. They are not one thing. And if we do this cognitive fusion, we're in trouble. Because in any given situation, we've got two choices. Accept or reject. And generally, if someone's behaving badly, we reject. But that rejecting, on the basis of cognitive fusion, translates into attacking the person. Because we fuse the person to their behaviour. So we attack the person, we get angry at the person. When in fact, actually the thing we don't like is their behaviour. But because we fuse the behaviour to the person, we, re we direct that rejection to the person. We attack the person, we get angry at the person. And then of course, if we understand that attacking the person, getting angry at the person is not very beneficial, not helpful, the only other option left is accept. But then accept, on the basis of cognitive diffusion, translates into accepting their bad behaviour. And of course, this is also not helpful. But they're basically the two options we've got if we do cognitive fusion. Either attack the person or accept their bad behaviour. And then of course, when we come to forgiveness and compassion, it becomes almost impossible. Because to have forgiveness or compassion to a bad person feels like what we're saying is, what you did is okay, I don't mind. Of course we should mind. Even to the point where we say they don't deserve forgiveness or compassion because they're just such a bad, evil, nasty person. Because with forgiveness and compassion, we are accepting the person and rejecting their behaviour. But because we've stuck them together, it seems like we're accepting their behaviour. That their behaviour, somehow we're saying their behaviour is okay. And it's even worse than that, because if we do this cognitive fusion, we end up with a fixed, biased view of that person. And then it becomes very difficult to acknowledge any good things that they do. Because bad people don't do good things. So if they do some good behaviour, we'll brush it off and say, well, they didn't really mean it because they're just such a nasty, horrible, bad person. So we end up with a fixed, biased view of that person. Of course, the simple solution to all of this is don't do cognitive fusion. Because cognitive fusion is a false and valid perspective. If we simply adopt the correct perspective, then we can accept the person, i.e. have compassion for the person. And at the same time, reject the negative behaviour, not tolerate that negative behaviour, and help that person to address their behaviour. And of course, we also do this with ourselves. If we have done a bad behaviour, the correct perspective is simply acknowledging I've done this harmful behaviour. But we often do this. I'm a bad person. And then of course, if we do a bad person, we attack ourselves. We beat ourselves up. And of course then we end up with a fixed bias view of ourselves. I'm just a horrible, nasty person. Low self-esteem and self-hatred follow. 
So I think this is one of the reasons we have such a lot of low self-esteem in the modern world. Because unfortunately in our modern world, there is just obsessive focus on the negative. We see that everywhere in the media. And then of course, when we focus on the negative with cognitive fusion, then of course, the natural result is, I'm just a horrible, nasty person. I don't deserve forgiveness or compassion. I'm no good. And this, of course, is also why we feel guilty. Because if we've done something harmful and we feel guilty, what are we focusing on? Bad me. So guilt comes from cognitive fusion. So we never need to feel guilty about anything. Because all it does is it just makes us feel bad, it paralyzes us. It's not even addressing the negative behavior. Whereas, if we simply adopt the correct perspective, then we acknowledge, I have done a harmful behaviour, we can have forgiveness or compassion for ourselves, we can accept ourselves, still have good self-esteem, but at the same time not tolerate our negative behaviour, address our negative behaviour. And this is where regret comes from. If we've done something harmful, and we regret, what are we regretting? The bad behaviour. So regret comes from a correct perspective and it's helping us to overcome that negative behaviour. Whereas guilt is coming from cognitive fusion. So we can throw guilt out the window. It's of no use and it's coming from a false, invalid perspective. Whereas regret will lead us to address the negative behaviour and to overcome that negative behaviour. So then, we can have good self-esteem and at the same time not tolerate our negative behaviour and address our negative behaviour and overcome any negative habits we have. Now, in our modern world, of course, there seems to be this epidemic of low self-esteem and self-hatred. And unfortunately, some therapies to try to overcome that flip to the other extreme meaning they're still caught in common diffusion and instead of telling yourself you're a bad person, tell yourself you're a good person. In fact, you're a special person. Not a good idea. Because one of two things will happen. If we believe it, we'll think, yes, I am very special. In fact, I'm better than everyone else. So we'll get an ego trip. And if we realise that actually we're not that special, that will confirm to us we're really a bad person. So the, the, the solution is not to say we're a good person instead of we're a bad person. The solution is simply stop doing cognitive fusion. Um, and then we can have good self-esteem. We can accept ourselves and at the same time not tolerate any negative behaviour of ours and overcome, address that to overcome it. Um, any questions about any of that? There's a few more things to say, but maybe that's enough for now. Um, this is all very nice and logical, but I have been trouble to, like in daily life, when I actually get in, in like it, it happens, when you get in a situation, it happens in a, in a blink of an eye, and you are there. Somebody insulted me, or I don't know. And I get into this fight or flight mode, like everything is blank and it's like I'm going to die, I need to react now. It's not there, this logic is not there. It's like, there, but we can't access it. It's always there. Okay, but... Why can't we access it? Why can't we access it is because we have spent 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 years programming ourselves like this. We are stimulus reaction machines. What's yes. Best? What now? What's happening is that I know that I'm there, but I cannot think. <laughs> because we still Ooh, have yes. this habit. Okay. No, and it would be completely unrealistic looking at this, saying, "Okay, starting today, I'm not going to do this. I'm going to do that." It's not going to happen, no matter how much you want it to happen, because stimulus comes, and like you said, before you know it, we're already reacting. So therefore, we need a way of stopping, starting to change that. And that's a lot of what we're doing in this retreat. 
The shamatha will give us the basis for that. Vipassana will give us what we really need to do. But if we don't do shamatha, we can have all the wish in the world to do this instead of this, and like you said, it just will not happen. It won't happen. I mean, in small situations, we may not stop and think about it a bit, but things happen fast. So we need to be able to be quick in our response. And the only way we're going to be quick in our response is if we have some mindfulness. And that's what shamatha will bring us. Shamatha will bring us that opportunity. Because there may only be a second or two stimulus to reaction, but if we have mindfulness, stimulus comes, we'll immediately see, here comes some reaction. Just watch. And then we can start to break this habit and start to do this. But without shamatha or some basis, it's like you said, it's not going to happen. It will not happen. That's the beginning. Then, at a deeper level, and then of course, together with shamatha, we work on this. We do compassion so that when that stimulus comes and it's a person abusing us, then we'll start to be seen instinctively, we'll start to see it like this, not like this. I mean, it'll take time. But we'll start to see this. So we'll start to see instead of there's a, a horrible person, there's a person saying horrible things. I mean, it'll take time. But then if we have shamatha, we can, we can see that. And we can see this person is completely messed up. They're creating so much suffering for themselves and for the people around them. And then we'll start to have compassion. And we'll start to go, okay, what can I do to help this person to overcome this sort of harmful behaviour. And of course, the real measure of progress is the reason we react is what we have done is we put a big target here and say, hit me, hit me. And of course, people hit you and you react. But we create that target through grasping. And that's what Vipassana is all about. Vipassana is about realising there's no target there. And if you start to get some taste of emptiness, people could say the most horrible, nasty things to you and then just go, there's, there's no target. And all that will happen is there'll be just this compassion, seeing that this person's completely messed up, they're, they're, they've got problems, they're creating a lot of suffering for others, and there's no target here. So if we do those three things, if we have shamatha, we can start to have a little opportunity to not do this. And then if we practice compassion and we practice vipassana, then we can really start to do this instead of this. But other than that, you're right. If we don't do any of those things, we'll keep doing this. Because stimulus comes, we'll react. It will keep going. We after it, I understand what happened. No. <laughs> right, but that's a start. That's already a start. But to, we want to catch it at the time. And without some mindfulness, it's really going to be very difficult. Very difficult. Uh, how do put uh, the target there? Uh... Okay. The target, like someone's verbally criticizing you, saying some horrible things. What's actually happening is some sound waves are hitting your eardrum. That's all. What we are doing is we're interpreting that and going, Ah, critical words against me. Me. But of course, if that person, those same words, come to your eardrum, but they're directed at someone you don't like, you go, good. So, it's all interpretation. And what we've done is we've made this target for ourselves. <laughs> Actually, somebody's mental affliction is try to eat my mental afflictions, but right. I know that. Yeah, I mean, again, we, we are creating the target. I mean, I mean, really, I mean, when someone's verbally criticizing, I mean, it's, it sounds hitting your eardrum, that's it. But you have to be really mindful. No, but, but no, that's, what, that's the whole thing, is that if you do Vipassana practice, and you experientially release the grasping, then you don't have to think, it's there, it's just, you're in that state, that comes, there's no target there. 
Now, of course, if we haven't done the passion practice, then we really have to think that it's going to be difficult and probably it's not going to work very well because it's so intense and so fast, mm -hmm. thinking is not really going to be that helpful. Only after the fact we go, okay, I should have done that. That's why we need these practices. If we do these practices and make them experiential, you will. You, you'll get to the point where someone says some really horrible thing to you and it would actually become impossible for you to get angry. And in fact, it, it, naturally, compassion will just arise and you'll do whatever you can to help that person. Because there's no target and you'll see they're just creating... Now, sometimes something. I manage, but I'm many times in stress that I will lose it. Of course, because mindfulness is not there and we haven't developed the wisdom and compassion very much. Of course, if we just leave these as intellectual ideas, it'll be difficult. Not much is going to change. We have to make them internal. But if we don't have those ideas, we haven't got a basis to think we might have a solution here. Because we think that there's no solution. But at least if we understand that, we go, oh yeah, yeah, that makes sense. How do I implement that? If I leave it as intellectual ideas, well, nothing's going to change. But if we understand, okay, how can I implement that? Right, I need to more shamatha, so that I can notice this and then I can, instead of reacting, I can start to do the opposite. But that's the only way we're going to get any results. So, it's so auto the, with the uh, goes on in the mind. This? Yeah, the, the system, I mean. Well, yeah, of course. So you need to walk off the goes on in the mind. Then. Well, it's all to do with working on the mind, of course, exactly. Yeah, if you don't work on the mind, then... <laughs> oh, oh. But it's not also the difference between trust and distrust? Trust and distrust. If I trust but trust, to right. To yeah. behave badly. Trust the person to behave badly. Not to behave badly. Right. Mm. Right, so what we need to make sure is that here is always wisdom. So yes, we have trust, but then if they that breaks down, then we address that using wisdom. So otherwise, compassion is blind. So blind trust, of course, is not helpful. But trust, of course, is necessary. This, I feel like this model is very simplistic in the sense that because it is, things are simplistic. We're making them complicated unnecessarily. Well, but in the, in the moment, in the, it's, it's never like some random person comes out of nowhere and yelling at us things that we can say, oh, there's no target here, we can and we have compassion to this crazy and you know, misfortunate person. Usually it's someone that we know that we love, that we have a complex relationship with. Sure, sure. Usually it's some, sure. they, they are reacting to something that is truly sure. Not, sure. Sure. not good that we have done. Probably, so, probably. So, I mean, <coughs> just having compassion and address, I mean, it feels to me like, okay, cognitive fusion is a distorted way of seeing that thing. So all I'm suggesting is don't do cognitive diffusion. that's all. Okay. I'm not saying here we, we can solve all problems because of this. Okay. What I'm saying is that if we do this, it's not going to end well. No? <laughs> Things get worse, don't they? They attack us, we attack them, they attack us, gets worse. Yeah. If we do this, at least we'll, stop, we'll, we'll cut the cycle. Whether or not we can resolve it, I don't know. You can't change someone's mind. But at least doing this, we've got a chance of resolving the issue. If we do this, we're, we're setting ourselves up for a big mess. No? I mean, that's all I'm saying. Is I'm not saying that if we do this, all our problems will go away. They won't. But at least if we have a proper, a correct perspective, and we've got some chance of resolving these things of ourselves and others. Whether or not we can, well, we don't know.